Welcome to Writer to Writer. I'm your host, Kat Filer, also known as KJ Filer. My guest is Christy Alexander Halberg, author of the award-winning novel, Searching for Jimmy Page. Christy is also the host of Rock is Lit, the first and only podcast devoted to rock novels. Her short fiction, creative nonfiction, book reviews, and interviews have appeared in such journals as North Carolina Literary Review, Main Street Rag, Entropy, and Concho River Review, just to name a few. Her creative nonfiction essay, The Ballad of Evermore, was finalist for the Sequestrum 2020 Editor's Reprint Award. Her flash story, Aperture, was chosen Story of the Month by Fiction Southwest for October 2020 and included in Best Small Fictions 2021. A native of Eastern North Carolina, she now lives in the western part of the state on the outskirts of Asheville near the Great Smoky Mountains, and I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice here. Yeah, it's beautiful. My mm -hmm. favorite place to camp in the whole United States is Lake Powhatan. I don't know oh, if you wow. know where that is. I love that. And we always go there for Leaf Week. So yeah, uh -huh. right around the corner for you. Anyway, okay. it's nice to, to see you. How have you been? Well, thank you for having me and I'm doing well. I hope you are too. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, we're getting ready to move back to Arizona. I don't know. Maybe I haven't Ooh. sort of chatted, but yeah, that's a whole nother story. Mm -hmm. But moving on to your book. For those who have not read Searching for Jimmy Page, which isn't going to be a lot of people unless they're here in search of a new author, which happens all the time, <laughs> but you have been requested, so somebody's read it, or several hey. somebody's. Could you please tell us about the book? Well, Searching for Jimmy Page follows 18-year-old Luna Kane as she journeys from her family's farm in eastern North Carolina to England to search for the man that her mother loved Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin her mother set forth this family mystery when Luna was a child that kind of hinted that maybe he could be her father so there are a chain of events that happen and off she goes to try and track him down okay all right she is an amazing character um uh can you tell us a little bit about her sort of backstory without spoilers and also was there someone that you drew on when you were creating her that's a good question no not really I didn't have anybody in mind that I was trying to emulate um she is the version of me that I would like to be she's smarter than I am she's cooler than I am so I, I think I just had that in the back of my mind and putting myself back in 1988, which is when the, the story is set, thinking about myself at that age and, you know, what I would have wanted to be aside from the family trauma that she had. So she's just a, um, you know, she's a ballsy chick. She's this young girl who's kind of a real punker at heart, but her mother loved, it wasn't considered classic rock at the time when her mother was infatuated with the music but her mother loved what we now call classic rock let's Zeppelin, the stones that that whole genre of music and luna let's see i don't want to do a spoiler i must said something yeah like i know it's so hard there's so much about her but you can say it then it's kind of like yeah yeah she went through some stuff she her mother died when she was quite young and it was a a very traumatic experience for her and uh, left a lot of, of unanswered questions that she's now in a position because some other things have happened more, more recently for her and that have caused her to want to find some answers to those questions. Yeah. And right at the age when a lot of people that age are trying to discover themselves, even if yeah. they, even if they know who they think they are or who they think their family is or who what they think their circumstances are. They're at an age of exploration, an age of breaking away a little bit. And so um, going to England, you know, wow, just taking off. She is yeah. crazy. <laughs> yes. She, and she was 18 when she did that. Now I have to say, I've been to England, but I didn't go until I was in my early 30s. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I have never just hopped on a plane at 18 and tooled on over to England. No, I did in my head. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but when it came right down to it, I was started thinking practically, where am I going to go? Where am I going to stay? <laughs> exactly. How am I going to eat? You know, <laughs> there's so. a little concern called money. 
Yeah, well, but but when you're young and if you're smart enough when you're young to just kind of jump and she did and it ended mm-hmm. up being a hell of a story. Mm-hmm. Um, can you, again, without spoilers, tell anything about Claudia or some of the other characters? Claudia is her mother. Um, the best way to describe her, and I, I did have somebody in mind when I was writing her. I was thinking Michelle Phillips from The Mamas oh. and the Papas okay. or, or Pamela Day Barr. I was thinking of you know, those kinds of, of really free-spirited women who were on the, the rock scene in the late 60s, in the early 70s. And, and Claudia really was this out-of-place flower child in eastern North Carolina. So she stuck out like a sore thumb. She definitely did not fit in. And um, see, other characters, Luna lives with her grandmother, Margaret. Now, my mother was not at all like Claudia. My mother was very old fashioned and and I I really, she was much more like Margaret, the grandmother. So um, yeah, I mean, they, they're they just this farm family in Eastern North Carolina. I did not grow up on the farm, but I'm from Eastern North Carolina. And a lot of the, the family stories that come up are actually from my own family. Like there's okay. a character, the great grandfather, Jesse, who's this sort of a mysterious figure. And in the book, he took um, like a mail order class on faith healing to try and, and heal his wife of breast cancer, which didn't work. Yeah. And that's my great grandfather, Jesse actually did that. Okay. And it didn't work for him either. <laughs> so I mean, they're, they're just, I cherry picked some interesting stories from my own family and threw it into the book, threw some characters into the book that were from my own family. Well, they were certainly interesting and segueing into the grand- grandfather. One of my favorite lines from the book was Ecclesiastic 610. Um, that which hath been is named already. Can you give us some significance to that line? Well, what I will say, readers, pay attention to that line that yeah. comes in the opening chapter and just keep it in the back of your mind. I think that has to do with a question that Luna is grappling with, is she fated to be one thing or does she have free will to carve out her own identity? Mm -hmm. And so I think that plays at the heart of that. Yeah. And again, at her age, it would be, that's one one of the questions you would be grappling with. Am I just going to become a carbon copy of the people that I came from? Or right. am I going to do something different? And if even if I do something different, was that my fate? Like you said, if it yeah. turned out that her father, her father really is a rock and roll star, then does that mean that she was, you know, destined for greatness or something? Else? Right. Yeah. And it, am I fated to turn out like my mother? I think that's a that's a big concern of hers. Mm-hmm. And for readers, if you've read it, you have some idea why. And if you haven't read it, you should read it and find out why. <laughs> The other one I liked was he talked about owls, such symbology. Um, and of course, I lived in the um, Southwest and owls are have a the same symbology that you put in the book. And I loved when he said owls like music. And then he asked if she could hear the music. It was so brilliant. It And I mean, there was so much meaning packed into that. Um, he's on his deathbed. But without spoilers, can you sort of elaborate? Well, the Led Zeppelin song for Sticks, which is on the fourth album, the, the album with Stairway to Heaven on it. So because it's on the album with Stairway to Heaven, that song gets overlooked a lot. It's always been one of my favorite Led Zeppelin songs because it is so rich with imagery, owl imagery, uh, the pines, like the owls crying in the pines, uh, rivers running dry, running red. So I, that song always stuck with me right from the beginning and I knew I was going to use it in something at some point. And so it really just, it lent itself so well to this particular story. And that the mother, Claudia, was such a fan of that song. And she would play it over and over whenever she had these these episodes, these kind of emotional breakdowns. She would always play that song. But the idea of the owls and, and it, it being... A lot of people think of the owl as symbolic for wisdom, but a lot of Native Americans associate it with protection and prophecy and also with death. Yeah. So I, I liked that contradiction. Mm-hmm. I liked that that aspect of that that lore 
Um, and then just playing with the other images from the song just really worked well in the story. It really did work well. And, you know, I had not ever listened to that song um, of course, uh, we talked about this. My husband is the big rock and roll, yeah. classic rock and roll fan, and he's taught me an awful lot and a little bit in our own conversations. We've talked about some of the other people he introduced me to, um, Jimmy Johnson, Crossroads. I didn't know anything about that. So there's an Robert awful lot Johnson. Of, Robert Johnson, I'm sorry. Yeah, and there's yeah. an awful lot of history behind classic rock and roll that if you understand, it just takes it to a deep, deeper level. And you kind of did that in this book. And when I was telling him about the book and I mentioned Four Sticks, he said, oh, that's, I love that. It's not one of those songs that, you know, it's kind of the backtrack. And then yeah. he played it for me and we were living out West. And I don't know, and you know, you live in, in um, you know, South Carolina and it means something to you, but somehow out West, it really struck me because I was out there where this is the kind of, the imagery is just right in front of you. So yeah. Yeah. And so now it's become one that I do listen to and really like. Right, right. Well, I'm I'm from North Carolina, but um I, I can't say that that it necessarily speaks to me of North Carolina, except for the bit about the pines, maybe, because I grew up surrounded by pines. I mean, I grew up in flatland. I'm living in the mountains now, but um I grew up in flatland surrounded by pines. So it spoke to me in that respect. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what inspired this book and at the time Ooh. that you wrote it? This book is so long in the making. I started, and it was a very different story, but I started working on it back in 2003. It was initially my Goddard College MFA creative thesis. Oh. And I think the story was vastly different, but that song was still a part of it. And there's a photograph that, Neil Preston took of Jimmy Page that was a part of that. That photograph and that song were a part of every incarnation of this book going over over 15 years. So my mother got sick and died uh, in 2003. And I did manage to finish the manuscript so that I could graduate with my MFA, but then I really didn't do anything with it. It wasn't, it really wasn't ready for publication. And I was not in the emotional frame of mind to get it there. So I didn't really write much of anything for several years. And then in 2014, my husband died. And oh yeah. Um, wow. So the story sort of shifted into um, something akin to memoir, sort of like grief therapy was what it was, but I didn't realize it at the time. I thought, okay, well, I guess I'm writing a memoir. And 300 pages later, I looked at it and went, this isn't it. This is this was great to get me through that period, but this is not the story either. So I started over again, and little by little, the story that eventually became the book emerged. And it was such a labor of love. There's there's so much about this story that has to do with grief, has to do with mother-daughter relationships, has to do with with carving out your own identity using art, using music and family lore. Um, and, and that really is what I was going through, uh, you know, just trying to use art to figure out who am I now without these yeah. people who meant so much to me? Who am I now? What do I do going forward? So this is the result of that. I mean, after my mom died, I made a pilgrimage to England to see Jimmy Page. He and Brian May from Queen were judging a guitar contest for charity in London. And I'd never been out of the country, didn't have a passport, got a passport and just decided, hell with it, I'm going. And I knew <laughs> I had to go alone. It had to be this, this solitary venture. So I went and I had some semblance of an interaction with Jimmy that, um, kind of plays out the way it actually happened in the novel. So I'll leave it at that. And then I went again in 2006. So every every place that Luna goes to that's Led Zeppelin related in the novel, I went to. So I did another journey in uh, 2015, which I, I went 10 years to the day of my first journey. Wow. First time was to try and deal with the grief over losing my mother. That 2015, I, I just thought, I can't believe I'm here again. 
you know, in this place in my life. And, and I, I went to England to try and deal with the grief of losing Bill. And then the last trip was 2018, because by then the novel had really taken shape. And, and there was one place left that I needed to go because I knew it was going to be in part of the book. And so that was the purpose for that trip. Yeah. Well, I envy you that. I mean, not for the reasons, but um, yeah. we're always going through some kind of a transition. And yeah. that, that's one of the reasons that my husband and I travel so much. Um, we find that, okay, well, I'll, and I don't insert myself much, but but I hear what you're saying about that. Um, we had a loss and we ran away from home. And uh, we luckily we have an Airstream, but we didn't come back for eight eight months. Wow. We thought that we were crazy. And I think that our family was about ready to have us committed because it was like, when are you coming home? When are you coming home? I don't know. We're having a good time out here. Yeah. <laughs> it was a little easier than going to another country. You know, we were still in the United <laughs> States. We didn't have to get, um, you know, our money changed or anything. But I think that the journeys that you go through like that are transformational. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm, yeah. Wish I had done yours though. <laughs> <laughs> is there um anything that you discovered during your research that might tickle readers? Ooh, I haven't been asked that before. That's a good question. Oh, what would readers find interesting about my research? I think just the actual interaction that I had with with Jimmy, and um, I also put this in the book. I <laughs> I stepped on Brian May's foot by oh, accident. No. So, yeah, he, he was nice about it, but his bodyguard was a, a big hulking guy, just looked at me and said, Brian needs spice. And I thought, you got it, buddy. Yeah, that's so, great. Little things like that. Yeah. Um, in your first trip to England, well, I mean, the book was written before your first in trip to England. Well, a version of it, yes. Okay. okay. Very different version of it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's talk about Rock is Lit, uh, one okay. of my favorite podcasts. Um, readers, seriously, you need to check this out. Um, and I would love for you to tell the readers about this. Rock is Lit is the first and only podcast devoted to rock novels. Think Daisy Jones and the Six. Think Searching for Jimmy Page. All of these fictional stories that have music or musicians playing a large role in them. And, and I think that they haven't really gotten the attention that they deserve. I mean, Daisy Jones and the Six has come along and now everybody, everybody's heard of that. But there are so many amazing rock novels out there. I mean, rock novels that have won significant awards and people like Jennifer Egan, who won the Pulitzer Prize for A Visit from the Goon Squad. I haven't had her on the podcast yet, but I want yeah. to. Um, Dana Spiota, who wrote Eat the Document, that book was a National Book Award nominated novel. Jeff Jackson, who got me on this journey because he's the first person to tell me there was such a critter as a rock novel. And I was writing one at the time and didn't realize it, but he wrote the, the novel Destroy All Monsters, the last rock novel. And Zachary Lazar's uh, novel Sway is fantastic. He brings together members of the Manson family with um, the fil avant-garde films of um, Kenneth Anger and the early Rolling Stones. That's a really great one. Chris L. Terry's Black Card. I mean, I, I have a whole list. I could just go on and on. They're, they're so plentiful. I think yeah. every bookstore ought to have a, a section just for rock novels. So yeah. there, there wasn't a podcast that focused on that. You saw tons that would have nonfiction books they would, they would focus on that, but not, and they would have the occasional rock novel on, but nothing that was devoted to rock novels. So it, actually the podcast came about by accident. I was attempting to email a podcast host who was a part of the Pantheon podcast network. I didn't, I didn't, hadn't heard of the Pantheon podcast network. I didn't know he was with them, but I, I got the wrong email address and it wound up going to the head of Pantheon, Peter Ferrioli. Oh. So he wrote back and said, um, well, I'm not the person that you want to talk to. Here's the right person. But I have noticed that you've been on a lot of our podcasts promoting your novel. And I just wondered if you had any ideas about doing a podcast yourself. 
And I had never thought about it, but immediately I figured, well, this is the thing that I, I should do. You know, this is the thing that's not being covered. So he liked it. He and, and Christian Swain at Pantheon loved the idea. And the three of us developed it and off off we ran. Yeah. And if for readers who don't know your background as a teacher, it would make sense for you to try and address these things as literature. Mm. So, yeah, um, I know my husband picked right up on that. Um, he, he did like your book and he really likes the podcast. Um, oh, good. Yeah. And he's not a reader, but he was uh, it, it. A conversation ensued after we listened to the first podcast together. And he said, has it not occurred to you that the lyrics in music that's poetry yeah and I had not occurred to me I don't know and I'm I'm one who's you know big on literature but mm -hmm. probably all of this stuff that they teach you in school and tell you is very important but then I started listening to the lyrics and there are songs that I do like that I listened to the lyrics and went oh I don't think I like that message <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah and there are songs that I've not ever heard of or never really understood and now this has become a whole sort of uh, I don't know what the class would be but my husband has me on a class now to understand the what he considers to be literary messages and how he also thinks of it as a combined art form so yeah. I think that's really cool and for readers um, who happen to also be musicians or be interested in music I think this is the perfect podcast um, whether those are the people that you listened to or not, because, um, yeah, you're starting to address this that way. And I think everything, you know, there's a lot to be learned, certainly is enjoyable. And didn't you get a shout out from from Alice Cooper? Yes, <laughs> yes, that was amazing. Uh, I launched Searching for Jimmy Page in New York and uh, at the KGB um, Red Room and uh, Dana Frank, who is a photographer, was there. She was kind of helping to put on the launch. And she hooked me up with Catherine Turman, who is a rock journalist. And at the time, she was the producer of, of Alice Cooper's syndicated radio program, Nights with Alice Cooper. And she she wrote up a, a bit for him to say and on the radio he he gave me a, a big shout out i've got that recorded and every now and then just listen to it because you know it's alice cooper yeah so, yeah <laughs> it was and just that, very cool i don't know about you but i would need all had my head would just go <laughs> <laughs> it was a big thrill for sure yeah. i bet so um there was a poster that hung over claudia's bed jimmy page at uh Kizar in 1973 yeah and it's a real photo yes yes it is a real photo taken by neil preston very famous photographer he was led zeppelin's only touring photographer from 75 to 79 and i can't tell you exactly when i first saw that photo but i do remember that when i saw it i had a visceral reaction to it it spoke to me in a way that I could not forget. So much like with the song Four Sticks, I always knew I was going to do something with that photograph. And, and of course, it's of Jimmy Page. And Jimmy Page has been such a huge part of my life since I was 15. But the photo is black and white. Jimmy's wearing white and he's got his arms outstretched and his lips pursed. And it just said to me, or it spoke to me of the duality that I see in him, this kind of mix of light and dark kind of there's an element of danger about yeah. him and then there's also this kind of angelic aspect to him as well that comes through in the photograph so that photo as i said earlier showed up in the very first incarnation of the book it showed up in the memoir and it's a big part of the final book and i had the privilege of speaking with the photographer neil uh, just a week or so ago, he's going to be on an upcoming episode of, of Rock is Lit. And I had spent, I don't know how long, trying to track him down and get him to commit to talking to me. And when he finally did, it was just, I went all fangirl on him. I mean, because <laughs> that his work in general, not just that photo, but his work in general just means a lot to me. And if anybody's listening who's a Queen fan, 
and you think of that iconic photo of Freddie Mercury kind of leaning back at uh, Wembley Stadium in 1986, and he's oh, wearing yeah. the yellow jacket. Neil took that. Really? Neil, yes. Neil was one of um, 20 people on stage at Live Aid with Queen, photographing oh. them the year before in 1985. And I, I mean, I could go on and on. He's just photographed so many uh, musical icons yeah. that it, it was a huge deal for me to get to talk to him. And he wrote a book called Exhilarated and excited and he's got a ton of his photos in there but it, it there's his writing is so good too mm -hmm. yeah. it's funny it's it's uh literary it's a really terrific book so if anybody's interested in learning more about neil grab that book okay yeah no i remember i remember that other the one you're talking yeah. about of queen i i saw that mm -hmm. and i mean i wasn't necessarily i'm into photography now i wasn't at the time um, I was not really thinking of, uh, you know, music lyrics as being poetry. And there's a whole nother attitude now for me about these things. And I and that is now that you bring it up, it's a photo that would really it didn't have the same impact that what you're talking about. But it definitely was one of those things where I looked at it for the longest time yeah. and thought that's just not a photo. Mm -hmm. That's actually almost like captured someone's essence in there. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. these photos definitely tell a story. Oh yeah. Oh, for sure. So they're almost better than the real thing. They're like, uh, tell you what they, there's, it's a representation. It's really, I really, yeah. I, I know who you're talking about. So Chrissy, is there a question I have not asked that you wish that I had? Oh boy. Not really. I am Technically speaking, I'm working on the sequel to Searching for Jimmy Page, and I say technically speaking because the podcast takes up so much of my time that it's it's really um, a, a slow, slow crawl yeah. through, <laughs> through this first draft. But I'm working on that and went out to L.A. this past April to do some research for that and out to Joshua Tree, too, Ooh. stayed in the room where Graham Parsons died in 1973 so that should tell you a little bit about who might appear in this new book. Mm -hmm. um, took a, an all-day rock tour with Pamela Day Barr. Oh, that was amazing. I going bet. To all, oh, my gosh. Yeah, going to all of these incredible places that I grew up um, just fantasizing about. So yeah. that was amazing. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. Um, so, well, in any time frame or you're still in early stages or? No, I'm hoping to really make some headway this summer. Yeah. And I understand what you're saying. Podcasts take up a lot of time. <sighs> this thing started off as an idea and I just thought, oh, let's try it, you, you know, and I had some friends and I threw some things up and I really wasn't for general consumption. It was kind of because some friends were bugging me. You know, this person, you know, that person, right. I never gotten to meet him. Could you put him up? I'd like to hear her talk or I'd like to see what he lo looks like in person. And I, I did a few. And the next thing, you know, I was getting more requests. And then people I'd never heard of were asking for right <laughs> authors I'd never heard of. And now I'm going, I have my reach. And then I have, I don't know, I can try, you know? Yeah. And, um, so I've, reached out and but then I did have to recently take a step back and say um I haven't finished what I started off to do as an author and so what I am now is a podcaster and it wasn't my intended career yeah <laughs> so yeah they it's very time consuming but you know it's time consuming in a really good way I know you're having a blast it shows <laughs> on your podcast yeah because it's, it's amazing getting to talk is. to all of these people. Yeah. And and with my show, I we don't just talk books. I play a lot of music yep. on, on the podcast. And I often have music experts come on in the last segment to maybe add a little real world context to whatever band or musical period was featured in the novel that we focused on in that particular yeah. episode. So it's it's like I not only get to talk to these great novelists. But then I get to go over to the rock world and yeah. pull out these people that are, have have played such an integral role in in that world. So yeah. it's it's great for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, audience, if you haven't already looked at the book, it's the background behind Christy is her book. Um, it's a fantastic. <laughs> 
um, cover. Not hard to recognize at all. Chrissy, it's been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you for making the time to talk to us. Um, listeners, I want to keep, I'm going to get back up on the soapbox. The nicest thing you can do for your favorite authors is to leave a review. And it doesn't have to be a lot. It can just be a couple of lines. You can just say, I love this book. Or, you know, just give it some stars. So that's um, something that I'm asking you to do. And also remember that gifts, sometimes you don't know somebody's size, but I bet you know what they read. So <laughs> books as gifts, that's a big thing right there. And if you order them online, they you don't even have to ship them, wrap them or anything. So there's that. Um, as always, I will post the links below so you can find Christy, her podcast, her books, and keep up to date on her other passion projects. Christy, thank you so much. Thank you so much. This was great. I appreciate it. Thank you.